My name is Sue Hazeldine. I'm a First Nations Kugula woman from the far west coast of South Australia. This is my country and I love it very deeply. I will fight for it. Back in the old days when our people roamed the country, the old people would, in winter they'd be out in the bush, out in the scrub. Come summertime, they would always come down here to the coast because Sujuna is actually Jurana. It's a Google the word for a place to sit down by water. They had all the seafood during the summer plus what was they could get off the land behind them. And they've been doing this forever. And we're still doing it. We still go out into the bush. We collect bush medicines and bush taco. And we come down here every summer and we live off the ocean. We look after the country and the oceans and they look after us. The ocean is our backyard. I've never ever earned a dollar off the land. And a lot of these people around here are exactly the same. That's all they've ever done. I've been a lobster fisherman since I was 14 years old. Spent my entire life on the sea. It's all I'll ever do, it's all I've ever done. It's beautiful, it's ours. When you live there and you look out there and see what's out there, it's so special. We have ospreys, we have sea eagles, we have the whales come through there. I've spent a bit of time kayaking around the islands of this area and seeing just how wild and rugged they are. We know the power of the Great Australian Bight in the Southern Ocean. The Great Australian Bight is a really amazing ocean ecosystem that stretches all the way from Western Australia in the west to Tasmania in the east. I've grown up next to the beach. I'm a keen surfer. Um, and yeah, I've spent most of my life here at Port Wollonga. I've had lots of close encounters with wildlife while in surf. Lots of dolphins often come through and are really playful, you know, want to surf with you and you'll get on a wave and they'll ride alongside you. Further down the coast in winter, there's whales coming through, which is really amazing. You can be you know, sitting in the lineup and a few hundred metres away there's a whale and its calf playing around and, you know, splashing and stuff, which is, yeah, magical. One of the things that the Great Australian Bight is the most famous for is its whales. It's a critical whale sanctuary. It's been established by state and federal governments over the years to protect especially southern right whales, but also blue whales, sperm whales, humpback whales. All of the whales that we see travelling up and down the east coast of Australia uh, have at some time hung out in the bite. It's a really important area for whales. And there are actually are 37 different species of whale and dolphin in the bite. Probably the craziest thing I've seen during this job was one day when we didn't have many sea lions swimming with us in the bait Hopkins Island. So the skipper sent me around to the next bay along um, just to see if there were any there. And as I swam back, I had 20 Australian sea lions following me. I felt like the Pied Piper. Having these animals that are all endangered following me for a swim felt really special. This island's just a zoo without fences, isn't it, Dave? It's it is, yeah. it, a zoo without fences. It is an enormous sub-Antarctic zone uh, full of all sorts of amazing marine life and the most productive fisheries in the whole of Australia. Here in Lincoln, um, we have the biggest multi-species fishery in the Southern Hemisphere. This whole town, well it's not a town now, it's a city, survives virtually and, and always has, mainly on the fishing industry. And virtually the whole coastline does as well. It's the most amazing coastline. Um, well, they reckon there's more diversity along this coastline than the Great Barrier Reef. Barrier Reef. Mm. The majority of ocean life found in the bite, 85%, is found nowhere else on the planet. You just can't see those animals uh, in any other ocean of the world. That's what makes it so unique.
The risk to the Great Australian Bight is that oil companies, as early as next summer, could have their drilling rigs just a few hundred kilometres off this pristine coastline, putting those hundreds of kilometres of cliffs and beaches and towns and ocean life at risk of a catastrophic oil spill. I mean, between us now and Antarctica, there is nothing but the wild and woolly waters. Any oil spill or anything out there is just going to impact this whole coastline. You go up to watch the whales, that's a beautiful time up there. And you're looking at the whales swimming below the cliffs. You look out at the ocean and you think if an oil slick's coming, they've got nowhere to go. There'll be oil behind them and cliff in front, they'll just be dead. The potential of a spill around here makes me feel sick. <laughs> sick in the stomach, to be honest. If a spill was to happen here, then the, the area would never recover. Imagine the whole of Kangaroo Island coastline. If there was a, an oil spill, the shoreline is the most important part. That tidal zone yeah. is where the most diversity of life is. Yeah. You know, you smother it all with oil, yeah. forget it. I think the surfing community has become active in this campaign because not only do we really love the ocean and have a strong connection to it, but we know these waters, you know. Um, we have really big swells come through here. It's really unpredictable and really rough, so the idea of putting a rig here is just, yeah, absurd. <laughs> there is no precedent for drilling in, in that depth of water in potentially catastrophic uh, wave heights. I can't believe that, that anyone would even contemplate risking that because, you know, they've seen what's ha what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Two years ago, oil giant BP, the company responsible for one of the worst oil disasters in history, tried to drill and found that community opposition was so great that it had to turn away. We've seen Chevron, a US company, do the same. And companies like Santos have delayed their plans year on year. So when you tell customers that these places that we love so much and that they love during the day, are at risk, um, it really hits home for them. Often people tell us how beautiful the sea lions were, how awe-inspiring the sharks were, and when you tell them, imagine if they were at risk, they suddenly feel personally invested in the issue because they've had that first-hand experience. To think of all the places that I've been on my sea kayak being covered in oil, or to think of the poor Australian sea lions that I've got to work this close with, to imagine them being lost forever is just devastating. If a spill were to occur in the Great Australian Bight, oil company modelling shows that oil could wash up on any shore, any coastline, all the way from WA to Tasmania in the east. If there was a spill, it would not only affect uh, the Bight region and us next door, but it has the potential to affect, you know, places like Bells Beach and really iconic surf spots, you know, further along the east coast. So it's not just a, an issue for South Australians, it's going to affect, you know, the whole southwest and southeastern coastline. All companies have already drilled the easy to reach oil all over the world. And that's why they're turning on hard to reach, risky places like the Great Australian Bight. Every year the Australian government opens up new parcels of the ocean for oil companies to bid on. Currently dozens of permits are held by international oil companies right across the Great Australian Bight. But the most urgent threat is Norwegian company Equinor, which has plans to drill as early as next summer. Equinor, which recently changed its name from Statoil, is a giant Norwegian oil company with a real taste for drilling in high-risk areas. The first stage of oil exploration is seismic testing. Seismic testing involves oil companies dragging air cannons that fire enormous explosions as loud as a grenade every 10 seconds, seven days a week, into the seabed to find out where they want to drill. The things that threaten our industry are a seismic survey. A seismic survey is a big concern for us and has been for a long time. And there's pretty strong evidence that any seismic survey damages lobster and we don't even know what it does to the pyrolus. And the pyrolus is the little baby lobsters. They're talking about doing their drilling out in the head of the bite. The seismic survey has taken place up and down the zones here. And one of my main fishing areas is right there. One of the biggest producing zones in the industry is right here. And they're talking about doing their survey right in here. What damage are they doing to the ocean marine life while they're even testing? It's, it's, it's scary. 
Are they damaging things beyond repair already before they even start drilling? After seismic testing, the next stage is exploration drilling, and that's where the highest risk of an accident occurs. It's the first time an oil company will sink its drills into the seabed, and it's so dangerous because they never know what sort of pressure or temperature to expect. When BP had its disaster in Deepwater Horizon, it was doing its exploratory drilling. It's two, three kilometres deep they have to go to the bottom of the sea, and then they've got to go another couple of kilometres down under that. They don't even know what they're going to hit. It could explode in front of them. No company can say we are 100% safe. Any company that does is absolutely misleading the public. What they can say is, look, there are risks here. We believe we have those risks under control. Sometimes they'll go further than, than that and say, we have reduced risks to an acceptable level. But to say we have re re reduced risks to an acceptable level is really an indication, an acknowledgement that they haven't eliminated the risk. So there are always risks. With both of the major spills that have happened in the US, um, the flow-on effects have been very, very long-term. So even when they think that they've had the, the spill cleaned up, the really, really tiny concentrations of oil that are still in the ecosystem are affecting marine life. I can only imagine the devastation that would happen if there was some sort of spill. We'd be out of business overnight. Not only the lobster industry, it's every industry that's going to suffer. From the mechanic to the you know, tire repairer to the people who sell us bait to the people who weld the boats up, not to mention the tourism business as well. That would devastate these communities. And the problem with our coastline here is so much of our coastline is so inaccessible. If you had a spill, you would only be able to mop up certain, certain parts of it. The rest of it, you could never get to it. The Great Australian Bight is wild and remote, with no access to oil infrastructure, like emergency services or rescue vessels. Where Equinor wants to drill is more than 300 kilometres from the Australian coastline, at the very edge of helicopter capabilities. The permit areas are in waters as deep as 4,000 metres. Without access to equipment, to boats, to the people necessary to mount a clean-up, dealing with a spill in the Great Australian Bight will be near impossible. The concentrations that we've been working with in the laboratory and with some of our experiments are in the order of a drop in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. These are concentrations that are affecting fish in a detrimental way, but might be profound um, in ecosystems for a long period of time after we think we've already cleaned up the oil spill. In the Gulf of Mexico, there were many small boats around close that they could come in and help try and stem the flow. Here, because we're so wild out here, there isn't anybody to come out there. They'd have to travel hundreds of miles into the wild, wild sea to, to try and fix it. Cleaning up an oil spill is a myth. In the Gulf of Mexico, less than 3% of the oil that found its way into the water column was recovered by oil companies. It's just not worth the risk because if anything goes wrong, my council, Elliston, in the modelling will be hit 100%. And I think it's our duty to make sure we look after this uh, world we live in. You know, there's plenty of oil and gas in the world. And it's, you know, we all drive cars, you know. We're on a boat that uses fuel. But technology's moving on at a great rate. Scientists tell us we can't afford to burn the oil we've already discovered if we're going to confront catastrophic climate change and limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So pursuing new oil in pristine places like the Great Australian Bight is utter madness. My vision for the future of Port Lincoln is a place where we don't rely on fossil fuels for our electricity. There's so much potential in this area for solar, wind, hydro, wave power, and a place where fishing can continue for generations to come with sustainable oceans, where people want to come to see the great white sharks and see the Australian sea lion and really treasure the amazing endemic species that we have here. I'm really worried about climate change. I think, you know, everyone should be. It's a threat that is going to affect everyone, you know, if we don't do something about it in the pretty near future. Stopping, you know, drilling in the bite is just one, yeah, step in a really big picture. We need to be focusing on renewables and sustainable energy, not 
where we can drill next. Stopping ore drilling in the Great Australian Bight is not just about protecting our coastlines. It's about halting runaway climate change. From the Arctic to the Amazon Reef, all over the world, communities are standing up to big oil, drawing a line in the sand to protect their most important beaches, their most important coastlines. From coastal councils to farmers and fishermen, surfers, mums and dads, you name it, the people of Southern Australia have said no to oil drilling in the Great Australian Bight. When the modelling says Ellison's going to be hit 100%, council unanimously no, we're not going to support Sorry. it. And that's, that's the end of it, we're not supporting it. Full stop. That no is not negotiable. It, it's just not negotiable. Money doesn't come into this, money does not enter it. And bribery won't work either. It's big, fat no. Everyone has to get together and say no. It has to be stopped. I think that the first time that I found out about the issue of oil drilling in the Great Australian Bight was probably only a few years ago. And back then I just thought, well, of course that's never gonna happen. You know, I knew about the marine parks that had been fought for to be put into place. Um, I knew about the amazing wilderness that's in this area. Um, I just couldn't even imagine that oil drilling off this coastline was a possibility. And then as I learnt more about the campaign and saw how serious it was, um, there was no way that I could not get involved. This campaign is about protecting my home, you know. It's easy to um, read articles about oil spills and, you know, horrible disasters happening around the world, but when they want to come and it's threatening, you know, your beach and the places you surf, then, you know, I think you have a, a decision to either stand back and watch it or you have to stand up and yeah, protect what you love. The future's not mine. It always belongs to the next generation. So if, if we win this fight, we've actually won for the next generation. Our actions today will define what our future generations inherit. Sure. I mean, you know, it won't be long and I won't be here, I won't give a bugger. But there's, I do now because, you know, I've got grandkids and, and I want them to be here on the island. And, it's not going to be the same, you know. Uh, these mob are out to ruin it, just because of what? Their bank balance. People around Australia don't know what's at stake in the Great Australian Bight. It's not as famous as the Great Barrier Reef, even though it's home to more unique species than just about anywhere in the world. We need to share the stories of the people who are in that community, who are fighting to protect the Great Australian Bight. We need to tell people about the amazing work that scientists are doing to uncover new species. We need people all around Australia who love the oceans and who care for our climate to let the world know this is a place they truly care about. If we do all that, the politicians will be forced to make the right decision and protect the Great Australian Bight for good. The oil company executives sitting in London and Houston or Oslo will know that the community in Australia is never going to accept oil drilling on their doorstep. People power will win this campaign. It's the only thing we have and I think it's getting stronger and stronger. Winning this campaign and protecting the coastline would feel amazing. Um, just, you know, as a show of people power that once the community really bands together to protect our home, then we can make really big changes. Speak up. Don't just sit back and say no, no, no. Speak up. Let your parliamenticians know that you might live on the other side of Australia, but you, uh, you care about what happens down there with your other country cousins. Speak up. In the face of massive community opposition, two of the world's biggest oil companies in BP and Chevron have already abandoned their plans to drill the Great Australian Bight, proving that communities working together can really have an impact. Our politicians need to know about the strong coastal communities, the industries that have prospered for generations, and the beauty and biodiversity that makes the Great Australian Bight truly unique. They need to know we won't allow risky oil drilling to put our extraordinary southern coastline at risk. I think we're like globally coming to a point in time where we either sit back and ride out this whole global warming thing and you know watch our homes and the animals and the places we love deteriorate or we stand up and fight for these places that we love. So yeah, kind of at a tipping point where you have to choose if you're on the sidelines or if you're going to do something to protect your home. Drilling for oil can only mean the 
disaster. It would be a catastrophe if anything happened to our pristine waters and our way of life. I am now putting my hand up across the oceans to invite other nations to join us in our fight against stopping big oil companies from devastating our beautiful great Australian bite. Not here, not anywhere.